Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Still Remaining in Title, Work in Progress, in its reports. I am back to talk about Bioscientic Root Search at the Pyra Cup, which is the team event that I attended uh, the weekend before last out in Poland. Uh, it was an eight-man teams event. There were six teams of us, uh, so 48 players, nice little quiet one. Uh, there were two teams from Poland, a German team, a Czech team, and a Belgian team, as well as our team of random assorted good players. Uh, the team was really great. It was awesome to go out to Mitrich, or however you pronounce that, and smash face at some Warhammer, as usual. Uh, I played a very different Gene Circle army. I played the Biosanctic Brood Surge army, which uh, we'll be going through whys and hows of that in a second. But uh, before we get into it, uh, I want to just quickly say there was going to be an episode on LGT and Ironstorm, but because it's taken me a while, I've been really busy over the past couple of weeks, and uh, the data I dropped, obviously, I decided that I'm going to put those ones on ice. I will potentially try to talk about them a little bit more in the future, but um, overall, those guys are those are going to be uh, going by the wayside for a little bit, and we're going to focus on the new metagame, because Biosecting Bruce has been doing really well recently in tournaments. We just saw Ben Jones um, go 7-1 with it, including playing two really awesome games on stream at the Coventry GT. Um, there's been a bunch of people playing it and doing well with it in the States, and you know, I think it's important that people understand why and how for both playing with and against it. Uh, I would like to get that GSC win rate down a little bit. We're starting to ratchet up a little bit past my comfort zone uh, to the degree where I'm like, ah, we're probably going to get nerfed now because we're too good. And I don't want that. That seems that's the opposite of what I want. So let's try and get some popular opinion out there. We will know what they're doing at the Gene Star Cults and they can figure out why and how to play against it. So let's start with what the army list is and then we'll talk about kind of why I went down this route for it. So uh, the army is Biosynthetic Brute Surge. Um, Biosynthetic Brute Surge gives you plus one to attacks and charge rolls for basically the melee units in GC. So that's Biofagus units, any unit which you attach the Biofagus character to. That is pure uh, ab uh, aberrant units and pure changing solar units. And then honestly, any of their attached characters get that benefit as well. Stratagem wise, you're looking at a few different really interesting options. The main ones being a bonus to charge strat from reserve, a plus one to wound against vehicles and monster stratagem, which is very big because these circles are typically quite low strength in melee. And you have uh, an explode on death stratagem for characters, which are really, 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 really cool. And then a few other support stratagems that are, you know, not half bad, but those are kind of the big ones for the detachment. I would say I use those ones almost more than anything else. There is also a six inch pile because all the stratagem, which is really good for doing some uh, jank in and around your opponents. We have uh, in the list, we have three abominants with aberrants. Those are kind of your workhorse melee units. They will do most of the damage. They have a decent amount of durability with their five field of pain, their minus one to wound. Uh, they definitely take more killing than you would expect. Um, they obviously can use the clan patrol to come back on a four up or a five up, so you're incentivized to use them quite early. And one has predatory instincts, which gives it the ability to free heroic and also infiltrate, which is really good for getting them up the board and into strong positions and kind of starting that trading game early and getting them into the fight while you still have your um, uh, plus one to ambush rolls and getting them into the fight turn one. Uh, so yeah, three squads of them. The abominants have the Phoenix Gem rule, so they can stand back up on the top when they die. They have decent attacks in melee. You know, strike 12, damage DC plus one is a hell of a number and certainly good for cracking vehicles in an army that otherwise can sometimes struggle with that. Uh, we have a Patriarch with Biomorphic Adaptation and 10 Christian Gene Slayers. He gives them devastating wounds. They naturally advance and charge. They naturally infiltrate. They have 50 attacks on the charge plus six damage three attacks on the Patriarch with Twin Link on the Patriarch. Uh, they rip through a lot of things. They will kill... Most things they touch with a degree, with a pretty reasonable degree, and we'll, we'll get into some of the games of like the the picture kill tally was fantastic this weekend. It was uh, really really cool just seeing uh, a melee character in terror just rip and tear. We have ten bio uh, bio figures with ten metamorphs. That's just he attaches to them. He gives them lethal hits. The ability to get plus one to wound against infantry once per game, and um, the access to the biosynthetic detachment rules. So plus one attack and plus one on the charge uh, means that unit has forty damage to attacks or sixty sweep attacks, which is pretty solid. Uh, you definitely can't be upset about the Biofagus' damage output. Uh, they are a little squishy. They have a Blood Surge and a 5 of Field of Pain, but they're, um, for the Anvil unit, they're definitely the most fragile of the ones in this army. Excuse me. We have a Goliath Truck, which is there to hold generally the Gene Sealers. Um, the Gene Sealers really appreciate the 3-inch additional slingshot to their movement and being quite squishy too in models. Uh, they do like the, the protection from not getting shot off the board by things like Exorcists or uh, even just like small indirect is generally a pretty big threat. Um, you know, you could lose a couple of them to all your opponent's Ridge Runners if you're not careful. Uh, another 2x5 Pure Strange Gene Stealers, these are more like your small skirmish units, you know, they have 25 attacks on the charge, they advance and charge, they infiltrate, they're good at like getting started on the fights, but if you end up spending them as an 85 point do an action unit, you know, they're very comparable to scouts and jump pack intercessors and um, swooping hawks and that kind of unit, they can do some damage if you want them to, they're definitely quite good at it, and with the recursion, 
uh, you are incentivized to if you can get away with it, but they are more than happy to just do some scoring. We have four squads of Acolyte, fan, hi, Acolyte hybrids with hand flamers. Love them, hate them. Um, they are consistent work, one of the army. They are your wound reroll unit. They're the thing that threatens things that try to stand their objectives. They just clear up things. They give you a decent amount of overwatch threat and they score points. Uh, I have five squads of them. Four of them have all hand flamers and a cult icon, and then one of them is just pure hand flamers. The reason for that, generally, the play style I find with Biosactic is you tend to be occupying the midboard a lot more. You kind of just like put units out and see what happens. And having the banners means that when your units just take like a random bit of incidental chip damage or a vehicle explodes near them, you can threaten to get them back and get them back to full strength. The army isn't crutching on them for damage output in the same way that my Outlander Claw list was, which means that I'm a little more comfortable having the call icon and dropping their units damage output by 25%. Um, and then you can do some things, because this list doesn't have any loan operatives, things like Kelomorph or Sanctus, I don't have anything that can just like stand on an objective and know it's going to be there because my opponent can't just run at it. So I can you can do the thing where you put like one Acolyte onto the objective, and then if your unit gets shot but not one shot, then you can use the banner to heal back onto the objective to try to score some primary or keep your opponent's secondaries to go down, you know, all that kind of thing, which is a nice thing to have access to. So I went with four squad, but I wanted to keep one with all hand flamers so that I have the option of doing things like rapid ingressing into Overwatch against you know an objective, or just you know I'm dropping somewhere where I know I'm going to be in line of sight and dead, and I want to just make sure that I'm doing the most damage I can. So I have one squad with uh, all hand flamers just to enable that as a sort of general play pattern. Uh, I listed the Goliath truck here twice. Ignore that. And apologies for that. Uh, we have two Might Ridge Runners with Heavy Mining Laser and Spotter. That gives them um, plus one to hit. So they hit on threes with their lasers. For all the same reasons they were good in Outlander Claw, they're good here. They have less mobility and less durability, but they're still generally just a good shooting unit. And then we have two Ridge Runners with Heavy Mortars, one with a Spotter and one with a Survey Auger. Uh, with two of them, I'm a lot more confident about running a Survey Auger to give the other Ridge Runner Squad Ignore Cover and plus AP, puts them to AP4 Ignore Cover, which is a very nice threshold for killing, you know, three up safe vehicles. Um, and then one with a Spotter just to guarantee the, like, the plus one AP. Um, the, with the plus one AP working in melee for Ridge Runners after, in the Codex as opposed to the Index, there's a lot more flexibility with kind of applying that to units that you're worried about and just making sure they go down. Um, so those are kind of like, I would say... It felt very good having two of them. I would have been very concerned about having less. The Ridge Runner Mining Laser Squad, I definitely enjoyed using. Um, it definitely felt quite powerful. Uh, it consistently outshot opponent's armies, which is great. Uh, for a 150-point unit, feeling like you're outshooting armies is great fun. Um, but I could also see versions of the list, like the one that Danny Porter played, that doesn't run this. Uh, I could also see versions that go up to four of them, like the version that I played against, against Ar Arik from the other Polish team, who's playing four Laser Ridge Runners in Biosyntic. And both versions felt perfectly reasonable. Okay, uh, and as you can see here, we have a wonderful picture of all of the melee element of my army that I just finished painting up and basing and such like that. Um, the new Mastery models from Necromunda are glorious and I love them, uh, so I used them as my skirmish units and then I had the picture with his uh, Pure Strain friends uh, to just keep the units separate and a uh, big fan of these models. Um, I can paint, I promise. I promise to the, the people who are watching me and who have seen my Space Marines on stream, I can paint other models to look nice. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now we go to the tournament as a whole. So with this being a team tournament, there was obviously a degree of um, pairings and um, board choice that go into all of these. And where it's relevant, I will bring it up. Um, but my first round was against MTO, who unfortunately, I don't actually know his real name. I know his name that it was on Turtle Keeper, and it was MTO. Uh, apologies, uh, who was from Belgium. He was playing a Beeson's Valance Necrons, which is the, um, it's basically like their pseudo at the moment. They pick a unit and they get plus one to wound against it, and then they have um, like a minus one damage strategy for vehicles and monsters, which would be the big one, and a crit five strategy, which is quite solid as well. Um, the notable unit in this army, obviously two dudes, the Ark of the New Points Reduction, and then Oricon, Overlord, and 20 Necron Warriors with the, the framework change gun. That unit is very durable. as a four performable save. It's got a res orb. It's got um, crit fives and full rerolls from the Eternal Conqueror enhancement against units on objectives. Like it, it shoots pretty damn hard. Um, once you stack on top of that, the fact that there is a ghost arc and there's also a reanimator in this list that I definitely missed off. Uh, there's a ghost arc and a reanimator. Like there's a lot of ability for this unit to just like never die. Um, so definitely taking down that was a priority here. Uh, I'm also kind of looking at this. I'm like, okay, what? So looking at an army like this, my general priority is I want to. Minimize this list's ability to score. There are not a lot of scoring units in this list. Like there are two Locust Destroyers, there is uh, a Psychomancer, there is the one Reanimator, and then that's kind of it. Like there's a Hex Mark and Deep Strike. Um, a lot of this is going to be on the board. It's going to be playing pretty fair. Uh, I have a, a decent amount of OC. Like I have all these Acolyte squads. Like I'm kind of pretty comfortable that I can, in Lynchpin, just bog this down on primary. And either if you know if I go first, I can hold it down, uh, and if I go second, I can like massively run the score up on it. It's going to really struggle to kill me uh, as long as I stay behind walls. You know, it's got lots of big activations, but very few, very little ability to do like small activations. 
Uh, the Silent King is probably never dying uh, unless he just like completely oversteps. Like if he just sits there and minus one damage against any of my charging units, I'm very unlikely to kill him. Um, and I want to deal with his warrior because, because I can, which is nice. I have precision in a decent amount, so I can try to precision out characters with the um, the Patriarch or with the Abominant. So I feel pretty comfortable in this matchup. So I ended up putting this down as a four on a matrix, which was a, I want to say like a 13 to 16 is what my prediction was. Uh, we were playing Lichpin, we were playing Hammer and Anvil. Uh, and as you can see from the scoreboard there, obviously this game went very well. I think there were a few things um, that uh, MTO made a couple of mistakes with and also like the list lined up really well. Uh, and I high rolled them a little bit as well, which is always nice. Um, so yeah, just like the kind of combination of factors drove it over the line. Um, but as we go into sort of the early game picture, we can see here the deployment. Uh, I basically just stacked up all of my melee in the middle. So I have an aberrant squad on the top left objective that um, infiltrated there. I have an aberrant squad that deployed in the middle next to my truck. Uh, that's the one, um, the one at the top left is the one that can heroic. It's there stopping an uh, flayed one squad from running onto the objective. I have my red runners sort of going across that middle room so they can come out and shoot. Uh, and then he has his Silent King, Doomsday Arc split out, right? Like all of his stuff here. And then he has like Imitech towards the bottom right objective. Uh, and I have my Gene Stillers at the bottom right. Basic idea being, I think I can just, if I go first, I can jam onto that objective, pick up the, uh, I want to say there's a Locust Destroyer sitting in that corner. Like just pick that up and then make it so that he can't really take that objective and potentially jam turn one, like take up all my staging positions and be ready to just charge onto the middle and just stop him from ever getting primary um and until like sort of very late in the game if he's still got stuff left uh, and if i go second i'm very defensively deployed he functionally won't shoot me turn one he might pick up that genius squad that's at the bottom right uh the bottom yeah the middle right if he you know shoots it with the silent king and a bunch of stuff but i'm happy to hedge against a genius squad being the thing that i allow to die if i get to go second here um so yeah that was kind of the sort of general thought process here um we're both playing tactical secondaries obviously and uh, he has this big warrior brick that's just sat right in the middle next to the Silent King, uh, which you can kind of see in the middle there. Apologies, I still don't know how to get my mouse cursor to show when I'm uh, streaming, um, which I unfortunately think is just going to have to be a thing that we have to deal with. Um, but yeah, so he has the, the warrior squad that are sat in the middle uh, next to the Silent King, uh, and then he pushes his Triarch Stalker straight forward at me turn one, and I think this is probably the biggest mistake he made in the game. Uh, he goes first, his Triarch Stalker pushes forward, uh, he goes for the kill on the Gene Stealer squad that's in the middle because he pulls area the dial and he decides he wants to go for it. So between the, the Trag Praetorian and the Trag Stalker and the Silent King's indirect, he wants to lift it, um, which he does, which is fine. Like, I don't think that's crazy. Uh, trading the Trag Stalker for, you know, turn one area denial points. He pokes his Warrior squad into the middle. Fine. Um, but then the Trag charges my Acolyte squad, um, which I think is wild. There are so many fail states for him here. Uh, the Trag Stalker only has four attacks in combat. It's only Trag 7, so it's winning me on threes. I have a 6-up save against it. Um, he's going to tank shock me, obviously, but again, at toughness nine, like he should be doing three damage. I'm very likely to pull myself out of combat. And I have an aberrant squad sat right next to the unit that's just going to heroic. Um, so he charges in, tank shocks me for five mortal wounds flat, which is wild, just lifts my unit. I fail the four up to bring it back, but my aberrant squad does hit a big charge and is able to swing into the unit picks it up in combat, and then is able to consolidate onto the middle objective, denying him area denial on turn one. Like, I get within three of it, like, he just doesn't get the card at all. Um, and then that puts me in a position with his warrior brick being there. My gene stealer disembarked from the truck, advance forward, the aberrants charge in, um, and then sort of, like, my uh, shooting picks up, like, his flayed squad moves backwards towards his deployment zone, because uh, it doesn't want to be charging my aberrants, so my aberrants in that building walk up to the edge of the wall. I shoot that with returners, I put a bunch of damage on the doomsday arc. Uh, I don't think I kill it, but I put it down to like four health or something stupid like that. Um, and then stage up some acolytes on that side of the board, pick up the flayed ones, and then I charge in with the aberrants that are now threatening the middle and also with the uh, the patriarch. And I go in, and the patriarch goes in and goes precision, kill Oricon, kill um, the overlord with precision just splitting the attack. Like I just roll the attacks one at a time. That one's on the overlord, that one's on the, you know, and then I just kill them both and... Uh, I think I killed 13 of the warriors and all of the Crypt of Thralls as well. Uh, pulled it out of range of the Ghost Arc and the Reanimator, and the um, killed up the Reanimator, and then the Aberrants activated in, tagged the Silent King, um, grabbed the Reanimator, finished off the Flayed Ones, and just kind of like put him very trapped in his deployment zone, like inside this ruin that's to the, the right of the central objective, and just pinned him there. And the Silent King didn't get out of combat with those units. Like I just kept chain charging him with like five man Aberrant squads, whether it was off of recursion or um, coming in off of Deep Strike or Rapid Ingress, and just chain charging there. Uh, and then I kind of, I took him off his bottom right objective a couple of times until he got a lock on it, and then I took him off his whole objective. So if we go back to the kind of the scoring here, you can see his primary goes um, threes and throughout. Uh, that's because he holds his home objective for the first for the first two primary turns, and then the side objective for the second two. Uh, he ends up getting onto his home objective again on turn five with the Silent King. 
Um, but I charge in and finally finish the sonicking off with a grenade on turn five, which gets me my um, assassination, my extended battle lines. It's kind of the the, the end set scoring there. Uh, meanwhile, I kind of just run the numbers up. Like I held my left hand objective for the entire game. I held the middle for two of the for two of the major turns. Obviously, holding it at the end got me the. Um, I want to say that's a 15 at the end because we were playing with the new Lynchman primary cap. Yeah, 15 at the end. So I went 8, 13, 8, 15, uh, which got me to 4 for primary, which put this game as a 19 1. Now, one of the things that was obviously the priority here was just dealing with this. Like, he doesn't have any small scoring units. There just aren't any in this list. And what he does is deep striking. He has one hex mark, which ended up ingressing into his deployment zone to um, give an overwatch there against my Metamorph squad when it rapid ingressed in. Um, so I just, you know, he, he gets 22 secondary points this game, almost all of which come on his. Um, his turn two, right? He gets nine of his points on turn two, and then he has a cleanse containment that he can get one of that gets him most of the rest, and then a no prisoners go on turn five, which is obviously a very good draw um, when I've got lots of small units running around. Um, but yeah, just, you know, drawing cleanse and containment and getting a two and a three, not being able to do establish locus, not really being able to do bring it down. Um, like, he did get unlucky there. My uh, my uh, Ridge Runner decided it was going to pass six up, pass a six up save and not die, which was great. But just generally, you know, combined with the small mistake on turn one with the area denial, just not getting him the... Um, like doing that, uh, like early heroic play, where it really put him in a hole that he could never dig himself out of. I never killed the Silent King. Like, if you know, I killed it on turn five with a grenade when it was basically irrelevant. Um, I almost just ignored it, right? Like, he was just getting bogged down. I killed them in here so that he wouldn't be consistently shooting into the Ridge Runners and just tried to get him onto his own reanimation, um, so that he wasn't like consistently taking my shooting my like transport units out. Uh, but other than that, he just like never really got a grip into the game. Um, it was really unfortunate. I know he played this matchup again. Uh, against Danny and did win it 12-8, I want to say, uh, which is obviously, you know, shows a decent amount of improvement. But yeah, I think the like the combination of me going first, having a solid game plan and being able to just trap him in. Uh, I don't recall where this board happened in the table choice, but this certainly is the kind of board I would have picked. I think this was a, like sort of one of the last boards. Um, but these kind of triple ruin formations on the bottom the bottom right and the top left are very, very difficult for shooting to crack into. And he obviously shoots pretty pretty hard compared to me. You know, he has the Silent King and two Doomsday Arcs, whereas I just have the one Red Runner squad, really. Um, it definitely put him in a bit, of a, a bit of a difficult situation. And I eventually was able to like crack into his deployment zone because he ran out of screening units, take his home objective him off him, tag up the Doomsday Arcs, finish them off. I think he ended the game with like Imatech and his Hex Mark Destroyer alive or something like that, um, like towards the bottom right, and his Ghost Arc, which I never interacted with. Uh, or maybe I killed that one, like turn five for a no prisoners or something like that. Yeah, um, functionally tabled him. Um, but I think it's that start from him being just too aggressive on his early, on his early turn. Um, he certainly would have gotten a lot more secondaries if he had played safer and slower, and he might have held his side objective for like one or two more turns and gotten this to like a 15, which is I think is about where my prediction would have been for me going second. Uh, I think I would have been fairly comfortable like a 13 going first or a 15 going second here. Uh, yeah, so here we kind of have the... Oh, I forgot I took multiple pictures. Yeah, so here we kind of have uh, he pushes uh, towards me, I then counterpunch, right? My Gene search squad comes in here, charges the Aberrants come in here, uh, the Metamorphs come in and clear up the sort of this side of the board, uh, his doomsdays are his doomsdays are like fighting this returner score consistently um and then that's kind of you know, like i just take take the board off him unfortunately those are the same picture twice cool um okay round two we played against uh, and uh we won this round pretty comfortably i want to say 120 points or something like that. i'm not going to speak too much about what the rest of the rounds look like uh you can find it on tourney keeper if you search for the pirate nations cup you'll be able to find the event it was on uh, october 20 something -th. um Okay, round two, we played against Poland. Uh, I played against Arik, who was playing Biosantic Brood Surge. So this was wild. I got to play uh, almost point for point mirror match. Uh, if you're having a quick flick through the rest lists broadly, he has an extra, an extra enhancement on his moment because he had some spare points. He has um, two less, three less hand flamer squads, but he has the Acolyte squad that generates CP on its own objective. He has a Kelomorph and he has an additional Ridge Runner that is a laser Ridge Runner. Um, so my prediction for this round is basically that this is a coin flip. Um, there is a lot of potential for this gap matchup to get really, really messy really, really quickly. Uh, we both have a ton of infiltrate, a ton of advance and charge, scout, all this good stuff. Like it's very easy for both of us to just start fights. Um, and when Jesus comes to fighting each other, a lot of it comes down to who gets better trades. And you don't always have perfect control of that because of the clamish mechanic on both sides. You're introducing a lot of variance to the game. Uh, there are ways and means to deal with that. One of them is to push on a turn where your opponent is coming is going to be coming back on five ups on their pushback. Um, so, you know, if you push on, like, if you're going first, you push on your turn two into your opponent's turn, you try not to kill stuff, but just stage up, 
and then they clap into you, they have to because you're in positions to do it to them next turn. You're still regenerating on fours, and then you charge into them on your turn three, they're doing it on fives, right? Or if you're going second, you kind of, you take very aggressive positions on turn one so that your opponent comes into you while you still have four ups, and then you clap back into them while they're still on four ups, but I, but you try to do the same thing. You don't kill stuff, you just put them into positions where the, everything is low, and then they, you know, like you're trying to deny your opponent the ability to get ahead. Um, so, yeah, I would say that was sort of like my general principle here. A lot of it is just try to absorb the pressure, don't do anything crazy, try to put units down low and tag them and hold them up, right? Like, I would much rather kill four out of five team stealers and leave one guy alive to score some secondary points if it's going to keep me kind of taking in the game. Um, the other side of this is that this is Burden of Trust, which is a very, very low scoring mission. Uh, it is broadly, if you're fighting over the middle objectives and neither of you are holding them, uh, two points of primary a turn. Uh, it is a very good mission for secret missions generally. Uh, I ended up taking one this game and kind of regretting it. It was very, very risky towards the end. Uh, I ended up getting quite lucky in keeping it alive. I say quite lucky. Uh, a, a confluence of factors made it um, quite lucky that I managed to keep it. Um, but there is definitely uh, a world where I should have just not taken that. I just kind of wanted to try the secret missions under the new format because now that you can't score primary on turn five outside of the secret mission, they do score a lot worse. Um, but yeah, as you kind of look through the score here, we both kind of cannibalize each other on secondaries. Uh, if I kind of look at the deployment, this is sort of midway through my push turn on turn two. I did not get an early picture of this game. So we kind of split the map. Uh, I took the top left side of the board, um, and then he took the bottom right side of the board because we're playing Crucible of Battle. Um, I, he had like one infiltrating squad at the top left. I had my infiltrating squads in sort of the middle right ruin, the ones near the measuring gauge and the truck. Um, I put my gene stores in there. He put his genes at the top left. I drove up to, with them with my red runner, I shot them with the stubbers. I picked up two of his red runners on turn one. He pushed them quite aggressively to draw my aberrant squad out. His aber his my aberrant squad then got charged by his patriarch squad and an acolyte squad, and then I counter charged and charged his patriarch squad with my patriarch squad and aberrant squad, and we just brawled over the middle. And like between the two of us, I think I got back. Um, I think I got back like one more unit than he did, or two more units because I pushed on. I pushed into him tried to leave things just slightly alive, right? And then finish them off in my turn uh, or in, his, in my next turn, like on my turn three when he was coming back on fours, but he kind of had to finish me off on five ups because we were in ongoing combats and things like that. So it just kind of put him in a bit of an awkward situation where through like the good timing on when I pushed, I was slightly ahead on ambush rolls. And then I rolled slightly better as well that they kind of like sealed the deal on that. And in the early game, right? We kind of slid into this nice position where I was probably like three units ahead of him, one or two through like playing through like playing with the timing slightly better, and then one or two through rolling slightly better. Now he did make that back up at the end, which is why this got a little bit messy towards the end. But unfortunately, um, the ambush rolls are obviously very timing based. An ambush roll that you succeed on turn two is much more viable than an ambush roll you see on turn five because you get much more time to use your units. Um, one of the things that I was really happy with this game, um, this truck that I have in the middle, uh, I was able to use it to re-embark in it and get a bunch of stuff that had brawled over the middle and then re-embark it and then push it onto the middle objective, which allowed me to just kind of keep threatening primary and bleeding him out of resources, which then opened up his backfield and let me go a charge onto it to kind of like open up the secret missions. He locked down this top objective sort of by turn four with an aberrant squad that I just never really interacted with. Uh, it never took damage. It never, it never came back. It just kind of charged there and sat there. Uh, and we kind of, we brought over this bottom right objective that I was trying to keep off primary. I kept just like dropping a unit, like running out of a blip, running onto this top objective and just denying him the primary, right? Keeping him to his, um, keeping him to uh, his twos, ideally. Uh, and we brought over the middle. I made a mistake with an ingress play here. Uh, I think, I think this is probably one of the interesting ones to talk about. Um, he had his metamorph squad that had, that had ingressed in and then walked through the wall to do a bunch of shooting onto my, um, my patriarch and my gene stores in the middle, uh, who had, um, like just killed the unit that was there at the previous turn and like tagged us from bridge runners. Uh, so he comes out and with that squad and I rapid ingressed my 10 man, Neophy my 10 man metamorph brick where two of where I had two of his metamorphs that were in range of all 10 of mine, but nobody else. So he could shoot those two guys at me. Uh, and then if he moved or to charge, I could overwatch with all 10 of mine. But what ended up happening was he rolled quite well on his shots for his flamers. And he had also put the ridge runner debuff on them. So he fired his mortar, killed two or three of them, I think. And then the flamers kick in and killed another like two. So I was suddenly down to five metamorphs when I overwatched and heroed in. Um, I actually just lost my unit in his turn, like down to like one guy. So which was a really big mistake. I think I should have just brought an average squad in there and just had a better heroic and not worried too much about like threatening an overwatch because it put me quite low on CP and really drained me out of resources. Um, and I it was one of those things where I felt like I was in quite a commanding position and I kind of threw it away there. If my play had worked, if he had only rolled like six shots and you know only wounded three times and I passed one of the five up saves and I passed one of the film pains and I lose like one maybe two guys. I don't think his charge works very well, but um, metamorphs to, to metamorphs are very lethal to each other in combat. Just the AP 
uh, AP2 on lots of attacks. Like it just kind of manifests out to be really, really difficult for um, me to like maintain my presence in that game at that point. I did end up getting the Menorce back, which were the unit that took his home objective on turn five. Uh, and the reason the secret mission got sloppy, uh, I was holding these the three objectives in No Man's Land that weren't the top left objective, the making saves one. Um, but he, I charged into two units on his home objective and he hit both five of Hammer's rolls. Uh, on turn on turn five on my turn was able to bring both of them down and then charge my metamorph squad um one of them hit the charge killed me down to i want to say three metamorphs and then with his five acolytes i was able to kill four of them back with those three metamorphs uh and i killed the objective three oc to four, three oc to two uh, and if i had failed that i actually would have dropped the 20 secret secret mission primary points and we would have 10 10 um, so yeah, big big ups to Arik for uh, making that one. Uh, shout out to the Aber, the acolyte that are uh, the apologies, the metamorph that passed three feel no pains against the damage three attack to live and keep me at four, keep me at uh, three OC on that objective. Um, yeah, really really interesting game. Definitely should not have secret missioned, um, but overall just like a really interesting game of what the timing looks like for GSC. It's really really good to go first in this matchup because you get to do. A lot of stuff with pressure right like i have scout moves i have infiltrate i can go and deal with a lot of stuff and i can put it down and then i get the turn two push turn of i get to go in and take all my staging positions and try not to kill anything you hit into me because you have to because i'm on top of you now and i still get my four regenerations and i clap back into you on fives um, and that's really really difficult to deal with but obviously going second you get end game scoring which is a big deal and you also get um Rapid ingress priority, right? If you rapid ingress on turn two, uh, you are using it on your turn two, as opposed to what I had, which is I rapid ingressed on my turn two and I used it on his turn two and I used it on my turn three. So there's a lot of really interesting dynamics in this mission where it's better to go first and better to go second. And a lot of it comes down to how aggressively you deploy. Uh, I took very, very safe positions. Like my infiltrating unit was in the ruin that's on the left of my deployment zone, the one above the Australia objective marker near the Ridge Runner. Um, and it just sat there and it was, you know, like three inches outside my deployment zone. And my pure strings were both in very defensive positions. And my, my Ridge Runners were in my deployment zone where they could push up to the top left and sit behind the terrain, right? Rather than doing anything particularly aggressive with them, where Arik went for much more aggressive infiltrate positions, right? He, he you know, was threatening my top left objective my expansion which is why i never got a hold of it so he did some really good stuff with like putting himself in a position to use his aggression from uh infiltrate uh, whereas i felt like i was kind of pressured obviously he has the four return as well so he had shoots me so i had i felt like i had to play a little bit more slow and for the melee uh, and then i went first and was able to kind of just push it home um and just get slightly ahead on the ambush rolls until obviously the end of the game where he almost got back into it off of some good ambush rolls so yeah very very interesting game um yeah big fan of the big fan of the melee matter it felt a lot more skill intensive than I thought it was going to. It, it definitely seems like one of those matchups that could feel like it was just going to be four point flips for who gets more units back. Uh, but it really did feel like it came down to both of us managing resources better. And, you know, it's like sometimes you got bailed out and you got a resource back that you wouldn't have otherwise, but sometimes you just didn't, right? And it was um, very, very interesting. Right, round three, we played Ike Lady against Pascal from Germany, who was playing Crusher Stampede Tyranids, uh, a fairly standard list. I would say the, the main thing that's different here is he has two Psychophages instead of sort of like the extra Malice Scepter that you would typically see in this kind of build. Uh, and he has a Horror Specs instead of an Excrete. Uh, that's kind of the difference from like the list that we that we had Nathan Roberts playing. Um, very, very strange. Uh, Psychophages are weirdly durable. Um, they're, you know, they're effectively a Rhino with a 5-up Field of Pain, uh, and they kick out a 6-up Field of Pain, which is... Yeah, it's not nothing. It definitely helped Pascal keep a couple of units alive. Uh, we were playing Taken Hold, which is sort of just generic white bread Warhammer. Um, nothing crazy going on, just five objective. Uh, I don't think it was hidden supplies. Uh, I am reading my, reading the notes. It does not look like it was hidden supplies. Uh, no, Inspired Leadership, which definitely did not come up. I completely forgot that that existed. Um, so I went first in this game, and if we kind of look at my, uh, this is kind of the end of his turn, or this is like my turn two movement phase, um, but we hadn't really done a ton. Um, he kind of aggressively staged towards the right-hand objective um, with uh, Terran effects. I had infiltrated into this building at the bottom right. Uh, I pushed out of it, charged the Terran effects, killed it, used the 16 consolidation stratagem, uh, 16 pilot consolidation stratagem to grab like an executor Terran effects and put like a big line in his deployment zone that kept him from accessing my Ridge Runners. And then I was just trying to ping the Ridge Runners onto a monster every turn. Just like use my charges, use my ingresses and stop him from getting um, any lines. So his Terran effects is just never interacting with my Ridge Runners. These Ridge Runners shot um, every turn of the game except turn one um they never got interacted with they just they stood on a primary and then they moved backwards and shot and they stood on the primary and they moved backwards and shot uh they killed the trigon that ingressed into my deployment zone 
Um, I ended up like dropping a unit on this objective, knowing he was going to put the dragon back there. He took he took objective to the primary alchemy for one turn. That's the five that I get on turn two. Is the turn that I lose my home objective. But I just very consistently held this left hand objective. The the ruin angle. There isn't really an angle across the across the ruins here to hold that objective. So once I managed to get my gene source scored onto it, like I I'm, turn one, I scouted and moved a ritual scored onto it. Nothing could shoot them, and then. Um, I pulled them backwards, put a Gene Slayer squad onto it, and then uh, I think I put an Acolyte squad onto it that dropped in nine to shoot something so that he couldn't Rapid Ingress the Trigon on it to score primary himself. Trigon goes into my backfield. I picked it up with the Returners the next turn. I think I contributed some damage with the um, the Ridge Runners. Uh, and then I just focused on pushing him up the right-hand side. Uh, this like Acolyte squad sat there with the Trine Effects in the X screen and the Death Leaper, and I think it held him there for two or three battle rounds, just they never really got out of this combat. He wasn't willing to kill the Swarm Lord because I had the truck sitting and waiting, um, ready to go across and like take his home objective off him if the Swarm Lord ever left. Um, so the Swarm Lord kind of got locked down on his home objective, and the Swarm Lord did eventually die to the Gene Stars. I just kind of committed them to him once the like the unit on the right had died enough that I was comfortable just going in. And then on this top left hand side, we have an X screen and a Malice Scepter brawling with another Aberrant Squad just for the entire game. I think they got there. You know, I charged in on turn two. Uh, I came out of the building that the truck and the Ridge Runners are at on turn two. Charged in, charged the X screen, put it down to like four. He fell back, shot them, charged them with the Malice Scepter, and we so that we sat there. Until turn until turn five, and I like eventually finished them off with like a Gene Seal Squad and an Acolyte Squad charging in as well, and then kind of rolled through onto his home objective uh, and got him down to the point where he was just like holding it with two Tyrant Effects, and he ended the game with two Tyrant Effects and the Vi were left on his home objective and no ability to score any primary. Uh, I felt really comfortable in this matchup. Like I know that I can play the angles with the Red Runners super well on boards like this. Um, this board in particular, uh, I believe. He picked this table, um, but I don't think he had a ton of choice left. It was sort of like a second defend table uh, where the like the lightest tables were gone. Uh, I feel very comfortable with the Ridge Runners just playing angles and just being like, I can make it so that you know nothing could ever shoot them. So you know we're kind of looking here. You know he has this trying to fix in this X screen. Well, if I measure that angles of movement directly forward, where does it see? Okay, it can't see past there. All right, so I know that if I put the Ridge Runners here, they can see this horror specs. Nothing could shoot them back. You know this turn effects up here is this turn effects up here by Death Leaper is tagged. Like he's never attacking my Ridge Runners, and I just chain repeatedly shot the Ridge Runners every turn and like you know turn one they did nothing they just stood an objective turn two they shot the horror specs i did enough damage to it that it degraded lost its plus two oc was able to flip the objective for storm hostile primary uh didn't kill the horror specs it charged my gene slayers and then i killed it next turn with my uh, pure strains um then the next turn it shot the psychophage then the next turn it shot an x screen and the last turn it shot a tyrant effects and just like got constantly just got me into slightly better positions um the end of the game kind of came down to uh on turn five he drew the only card that could score a point to get into a 14 uh, to from a 14 6, which was hilarious. Uh, but admittedly, I had gotten very lucky. Um, I had killed, put Death Leaper down to one wound, uh, had nothing else that could interact with him, and then I killed the killed his X screen and it exploded and killed Death Leaper, which was the last thing he had on that objective, which stopped me scoring extended battle lines. Um, so Pascal got a little bit scammed at the end there. Um, but yeah, this was one of those games, like, he had to Shadow in the Warp to score his primary, like, my Metamorph squad ingressed, uh, you can see it here, it's the unit that's sort of just been up between, behind the two containers on my side of the board, ingressed there, walked across, charged the Psychophage, left it on one wound, but took the objective off him, so he had to use um, Shadow in the Warp defensively to score a 10 primary, um, and, for, like, fortunately, I feel for him, I failed the Battle Shock, and he got his 10 that turn, but after that, I was able to just kind of take a turn off, let him have it for that turn, and then commit to take him off the side objective and try to take him off the deployment zone objective. Um, and yeah, was able to kind of maintain that. One of the things that did stand out in this matchup, actually, is the Gene Slayers are really bad at tagging Terrative Monsters. Um, they are great at killing you. Like, they're just their damage too, and their AP, their lack of AP doesn't matter at all. So my um, Gene Slayer scope is just getting its shins kicked in by like, yeah, so you've tagged a Tyrant Effects in an X screen. Here is like five saves. You fail three of them. You're like, oh, I can't coherency and have both of these in combat anymore. Um, so you, I definitely found myself in a situation of that. Uh, but the other funny thing that came up, the um, once he lost his Synapse Auras, uh, the the Patriarch's take a battleship test aura was definitely causing him like minor problems because it was much more difficult for him to fall back from me without just losing monsters occasionally. Um, that was quite funny. Uh, not a huge deal. I only I think it only came up twice, but it definitely you know he he rolled pretty well on his battleships, but it definitely could have. Um, but yeah, the kind of the main thing here, Pascal did a like. You know, I played really aggressively around locking down my top left objective and pressuring him to never get access to it. Uh, and I don't think Pascal had enough pressure on that left hand side. But the Gene Steelers, I just had so much stuff and so much ability to kill his monsters. Like each of the Aberrant squads killed a monster pretty comfortably when it charged and then took at least a turn to deal with and realistically did some damage more on the way through. The Ridge Runners were unstoppable. They just shot half a monster to death every turn. They killed like two and a half monsters over the course of the game. The Patriarch got to go in and one shot a monster and then lived a turn and got to try and do some damage again. I think finished off uh, finished off the first round effects that I killed. 
uh, or the second round effects, just like put it was very easy for all of my units to trade with all of his while doing it from safety and while scoring points while doing it. So this felt like a really good matchup. And I think typically these kind of shooting matchups are pretty good for Biosynthetic if you don't play on a super light board. If you have good staging positions and you can play rapid ingresses, um, you're very consistent about hitting charges, you have infiltrate. Like if I infiltrate a unit on and touch a wall against an army like Bio, against like Crusher or Renegade Raiders that doesn't have a ton of shooting, I can just put myself nine inches away from the edge of the objective and if he wants to stand on it i have a like a four inch charge onto anything on that objective and i'm pretty comfortable about rolling a four inch charge with a reroll with an aberrant squad yeah if you fail it it's gonna suck right but if, but you can't play around the the tiny risks like that um so yeah i was really happy with this game um Calm of us would have helped a ton with stopping the strike on coming in but it would have just taken a different objective off me so it's kind of the there's a real, very real thing going around right now with like Aqualons and Trigons and stuff like that. They're going to take an objective off you. It doesn't matter that much which one it is, is kind of where I'm kind of getting to at the moment, especially in teams where I'm just like, if I'm playing against Guard and it's on my board choice, I'm going to get a small win anyway. And if it's on their board choice, like the, the fact that they be, that I have a common of us to stop Aqualons taking my home objective isn't going to change the score. Um, so I'm kind of ambivalent on whether I do or don't want a common of us in this list going forward. I think for now, I'm going to continue playing without it. And we'll talk about um, changes to the list at the end. Obviously, we have two more games to run through. Okay, so game four, I played against Dave from Poland, who was playing Vanguard Onslaught Tyranids. This was a 30 gene stealer list. Uh, we played, um, it was either Hammer and Anvil or Tipping Point. I want to say it was just Hammer and Anvil. Um, we played uh, Burden, uh, Terraform, Terraform, the uh, go, go first, score a bunch of primary mission, uh, which they definitely did. Um, so my sort of general thought process with this matchup, I had this down, oh, and uh, just to quickly run through, uh, I had the Germany game down as a 4, so I was predicting a 13, uh, 13 plus, and I got a 13. Um, I think if I had gone second, this would have been like a 15 plus, uh, which is again kind of the same thing, right? Like I always pair assuming the worst case scenario, uh, which is that I, my opponent high rolls a little bit, I low roll a little bit, and I get my, their, they get their preference of first or second turn, um, and you know, so this went about like that. I didn't get a ton back this game. You know, some of the stuff I did never really did much. Um, you know, got, got a couple of units back that were relevant, right? Of course you do. Like I'm playing so many units that you're going to get some stuff back that's relevant on average. Uh, we'll talk about that in the next game. Um, but yeah, if I go second or if I had had a little bit better luck, you know, there was one time a Palace Scepter passed four out of four invulnerable saves against DC plus one damages. I was like, oh, it would have been really nice for that thing to just be dead right now. Um, but such is life, right? You can't, uh, that's one thing Biosetting doesn't have as a fallback and charge strategy. Uh, so once you're in combat, you are there until one of you dies. Uh, it is very much the, you are committing, go and play the game detachment, which I quite enjoy. Okay. Um, so yeah. Game four in today of Vanguard Onslaught Tyranids, I have this predicted as a four as well. Um, part of that was predicated on the fact that I would have table choice here, uh, which I did. Um, he's playing a lot of stuff, but it's very much like he has three units and then some shooting, and that's kind of it, right? The Von Ryan's Leapers kind of count, the Tyrant kind of count. But overall, it's mostly just three Broodlord, like three Broodlords plus 30 Gene Stealers, and they do one thing, and then they should ideally be dead after that. Um, so I was able to pick a board that had really poor sight lines, um, and then we kind of get into the fact that, well, all of his stuff does have Scout 8, so it is on top of you fast, and everything advances and charges. So I took this very, very cagey deployment, like I have my Gene Search Squad on the left-hand side here, I have another Gene Search Squad on the bottom left near the Statue Objective, I have my other one by the Australia Objective, walling just outside an inch of the wall on the inside of this room, so that I have my Aberrant Squad with Infiltrate, sat in a nice aggressive position where it's got a Heroic available on anything that charges the Gene Stealers, I have my truck just defensively behind that, and then my other Aberrant Squad is just to the south of the truck, you can't really see it, you can maybe see like the tip of the guy's stop sign behind the, the big L Ruin in my deployment zone, and then at the back left I have my Ridge Runners ready to pressure his objective if I go first. Uh, they're in a position where they can drive forward, get within 18 of the Von Ryan sleepers that are on that objective, and shoot them and like not really be interacted with back. Now, the main reason I picked this board is that it has these two containers at the edges next to the objectives, which makes it really, really difficult for him to bring on his shooting and anywhere relevant. So he has two X-Screens and a Zone Throp squad that he put both of off the board, uh, or all three of off the board, and Vanguard has a strategy to bring in from Reserve Return early. So I definitely needed to put a little bit of pressure on those side objectives. I couldn't just completely fault them. So my scout moves um, were able to make it so that if he came on the top side uh on the the north then he wouldn't be able to get any line of sight on anything and if he came on the south side it was screened out by the gene sealers so he wasn't going to be able to bring any reserves and to do anything relevant turn one um and he wasn't going to be able to come in my backfield yet um so i had some decent aggressive positioning uh and then if i went first i was going to be able to walk onto all the objectives and start terraforming and shoot his von ryan's hopefully kill a lot of them and put myself in a decent position and stage up and you know i have my reserves coming in on turn two immediately and i can kind of weather the storm for a turn he's going to get to run at me a lot and hit me but i you know i get to bring my reserves in so that's kind of fine 
Uh, instead, they went first and ran directly at me. Um, so he kind of just runs, this one Ryan squad runs directly down towards the Gene Stealers and the Aberrants. Uh, all three Gene Stealer squads run directly forward. Uh, Death Leaper advances forward. His Gargoyles walk onto this uh, objective at the bottom of the stat check one. And then two Neural Electors terraform the two middle objectives um, or start terraforming the two middle objectives. So he gets very, very aggressive very quickly. And uh, we can kind of roll into, uh, this is the end. This is my turn one uh, end of movement phase. Um, he just full helper leathered at me. So uh, he killed, I think, two aberrants out of the bottom squad, nine damage on the truck, two aberrants out of the top squad, nuked this Gene Sealer squad that was in on the Australia objective, and then Death Leaper uh, flipped, flubbed a little bit. Twos and threes is just messy. He wasn't in setup range. Uh, twos and threes, he killed two Gene Sealers. I put like three damage back on him, and then I just fell back. Uh, I wasn't able to contest that objective, but I was able to make him burn the Vanguard stratagem to loan up the Gargoyles, so I couldn't shoot them with indirect and take the objective off him. Um, so, uh, he did not get that terraform off. Yeah, he didn't terraform there because the gargoyles couldn't. Um, the gargoyles had advanced, so they weren't able to do that terraform. Uh, the truck desperate escaped over the top of his gene stealers and stood on this objective and denied the terraform here. So he ended up getting the one terraform at the top. Uh, I brought my my gene stealers, out, my returners out somewhere where he wouldn't be able to get land and set them with the next screen that came in on the board edge side. Uh, screened my backfield out and then shot this gene stealer squad on the Australia objective to death. Uh, I think I killed six of them. Um, I charged the the two brood lords, the two squads in the middle. Uh, I disembarked my jeans, my patriarch squad. I charged him with the uh, I kept sitting on with the two aberrant squads, uh, and I fired you know like some stubborn things like that at him, just sort of general control damage. And I was able to pick up um, both of the the full squad at the bottom got picked up, including the including the brood lord. The one in the middle, I precisioned out the brood lord and put it down to four guys, and then the top squad got left to four in the brood lord. So I killed twenty two gene stealers and two patriarch and two of his brood lords on my turn on my turn one and put him in a very difficult position because that's most of his most of his pressure is gone right like he just didn't connect very much like he charged in with the von ryan's leapers into the gene stealers first because they were just coming in on an awkward angle and one of the squads had rolled a low advance and just wasn't gonna be able to get too much anyway like just because of the with being an inch off the wall yes he can charge me through the wall with the wc uh, engagement range rolls so he you know he can barricade through but only so much of it gets to fight and it doesn't it wasn't gonna be able to consolidate into my my uh into my aberrants very well and my aberrants had heroic so the second the von ryan's charged in i heroic i get my plus one to charge from biosynthetic slid around and went to the very back of the unit and dragged myself away from all of his charging units uh and there wasn't really a good way for him to do this whichever unit he charged with first i was going to heroic away from it and go into like wherever wherever the extremes of that unit was um so and the von ryan's just don't do very much damage like they're 30 attack 36 attacks on threes like you're talking 24 hits wounding on fours is 12 wounds and then uh that was only because he was in center range if he hadn't been in center range, it would have been even worse uh and then you know like i get a six of save so i take 10 and then i have film of pains so i lose two two guys right which is exactly what happened the other gene Stealer squad full lifted an aberrant brick because it or uh, sorry full lifted a, a gene Stealer brick, and then the other one just bounced into the aberrants and killed two of them right which is probably slightly below average but i rolled pretty well on my film of pains um you know he rolled pretty well on his like brutal attacks, but like two of them, the way the way that he charged, because uh, he came really far to get into them. Like two of them were closer to my, um, two of them were closer to my gene stealers and weren't able to attack anyway. Three of them got stuck stuck into the truck, so it was only like five gene stealers of the brute lord actually attacking the barons here. Just the way that I had strung my deployment out, it was very difficult for him. And with Death Leaper rolling, it was really hard for him to get a lot of guys into combat. Uh, so it's just like if you're playing against an army like this, just be very careful of exactly where you put your things. If you can try to have things that will pull big units like genesis apart you can deny like two or three of them attacking here and there and that's the difference between me swinging back with three aberrants and killing like five dudes and me swinging back with two aberrants and killing three dudes right like it's just the the difference in sort of like the damage output is very very real here um so yeah that was kind of his turn he gets the one turn up there he obviously gets a 15 on primary because he gets the bottom objective the top objective and his back objective i think those are, and and he has the australia objective as well so he gets a 15 on primary um and then uh, he claps back into me, his, um, and when I say clap back, like, Death Leaper comes down, charges into the Aberrant squad, uh, ends up dying, I think. He just gets, he just gets killed, um, because I wasn't in combat anymore. Um, the Gene Slurs fell back from my Broodlord, they, and then, like, he just kind of seats the board to me. He brings in his reserve, he, like, leaves all his reserves in, uh, his Broodlord squad charges in, and, um... I think, I think honestly, like, because I had too many heroics there, his brutal squad just kind of sat there and did some, or like jumped onto my home objective and didn't even charge. It just denied me the, denied me the primary, which was pretty smart, I think, because uh, I had a heroic in place for anything that he tried to do too cleverly. Um, but yeah, he, is this the same picture again? 
no, this is sort of the end of my, yeah, this is, that's the end of my movement phase. This is the end of my, my charge, right? So I've kind of cleared up a bunch of the stuff. Like I'm down, uh, to just the abominant and the one guy, uh, I've still got that objective there and then yeah, deny the objectives. Uh, and then I don't have a picture for the next, for, from here. So this is kind of the end of the pictures. Um, but yeah, so he brings in the reserve. I, he kind of like goes backwards, takes that objective off me, just kind of sits. I think the, um, tyrant charges the truck and sits in the middle for area denial. Um, and just puts himself in like a pretty reasonable position. The Patriarch Squad goes in, charges the Tyrant, lifts him, which puts the Tyrant's kill count at two uh, Tyrant Tyrants because he killed the Swarm Lord and then the, the, this guy just in one shot. Um, and then the Ridge Runners, uh, he walks the Neuralixer forward to threaten a charge onto my Ridge Runners. I rapid ingress the Metamorphs behind this wall to threaten a heroic if he does that. So he wasn't able to charge me, but he had brought his two X screens in there um, to like shoot the truck to death just because he wanted to get them on the board, start the right pressure, put some OC on the objective. Uh, and I wasn't going to be able to get to them pretty reasonably, um, other than with the returner squad, which he was hoping to tag. Um, so I ended up in my turn walking out that acolyte squad or that metamorph squad, flaming backwards into the gene sealers that were on my home objective, um, charging the metamorph, Charging the meta, the charging the neuroelector, sorry, with the metamorphs, charging the metamorphs with the ridge runners, which allowed me to move them sideways behind this container. So I'd shot an exegreen pretty low, down to like, I want to say like six, seven, I did like six, seven damage to it, uh, put it pretty low. Uh, and then I was able to charge the neuroelector in such a way that I was able to hide from the two neural, the two exegreens shooting me back. So they couldn't see the, they couldn't see the ridge runners because I charged him. Uh, and then I used the six inch pile and a consolidation stratagem to swing the entire unit around the neuroelector onto the objective. And they could then kill the neuroelector with, you know, my 50 damage attack, 52 damage attacks, and then pile into the X screen and tag it on his objective, take the objective off him. Um, and then, you know, he couldn't really fall back from me. Uh, even if he did, I have a blood surge move, so he wouldn't have even got very far. And then I, so I held that objective and then I killed the X screen in his turn. Or I think I maybe killed it with pistols or something like that, and then I ch charged into the other one and just kind of like, closed the game out. Uh, he brought his uh, neuroelector squad down where the gargoyles are. Uh, I ingressed an aberrant squad on top of it and charged it because uh, Deathly Brew was dead. And so we kind of go and see the scoreboard here. Um, yeah, Dig gets a 15 and then a 10 and then a 6 and then a 6. He kind of holds his home objective the entire game with a biovore. I never even really try. He puts two spore mines in his backfield so I can't get back there. If you're playing against armies that you don't need the advanced blocking, um, often just put spore mines in your backfield so the rest of your army can play quite aggressively. It's a good way to play it. Um, and then, yeah, I got a 0 on primary on turn 2 and then a 15 from there. Uh, I think I ended up getting some terraforms and getting some cool charges. Um, and then, yeah, just like I ran through my secondary score, barreled it up, got 37. Uh, he stalled out very much on turn 4. Um, and just kind of ran out of ability to score points. Uh, that is one thing. His unit, this doesn't have a ton of units for having a lot of stuff. It doesn't have a lot of units. So his turn one, when he ran at me, he had cleanse and just, he chose the terraform instead of cleanse, which is obviously the right play mission agnostically, but it definitely resulted in his score being a lot lower um, on like the early turns on secondaries. Um, so yeah, overall, I felt really good about this matchup. The board choice made it just very, very difficult for him to play. You can imagine this on like a GW layout seven or eight as well, where just there's nowhere good to come on the board edges. And it was very, very difficult for him to do anything about that. Uh, and then obviously I have recursion on top of everything. I did not get a single unit back this game. Uh, not one. Did not, did not matter. Um, you very much can just play for winning the game without getting anything back, and you will often be able to do it. Um, yeah, I still don't love Vanguard on such uh, especially sort of like this style of build that doesn't have like the warriors that have a bit more damage. Um, the Gene Slayers definitely felt a little anemic, even with Strength 5 and Rural 1s to hit and wound uh, against his objectives. I just didn't put anything good on an objective, and they never really did the damage that I was expecting out of them, um, which is a shame because I think that's a really cool unit. Um, I also did a pretty good job of passing battle shocks against the uh, the Vanguard Onslaught stratagem, the Surprise Assault. Uh, he just never really got the plus one to wound off, which did, didn't help either. He ended up having to reroll a charge, I want to say, uh, which put him pretty low on CP. Uh, he didn't have one available uh, for some reason. The Hive Tyrant was too far back for him to free strat or something like that. So he free strat a Surprise Assault somewhere that wasn't as good as it would have liked to be. And I passed the battle shock test and just didn't take that much damage. Um, so yeah, a little awkward, but overall pretty happy with the game i felt good about a turn one plan going first or going second and it clearly worked and then once my reserves started coming in he just didn't have enough stuff left to really stop it um and his units are all very fragile so yeah felt really good about this matchup i definitely feel like tyranids are one of those things where cults just kind of have their number uh it feels very very winnable uh in kind of all iterations uh and that's the pictures of the game yep not much changing in there uh my last round was against uh, tomash from czechia Chechia, Chechia. I'm really sorry, chat. I'm just really sorry, people. Uh, I will never pronounce that right because people make fun of me when I get it wrong. Uh, but yeah, this was Renegade Raider Chaos Space Marines playing a fairly typical 
um, bit of everything. Uh, the interesting thing here, we saw the new Obliterator and War Talent Points drops coming in, where he's got a couple of them, and he has the Sorcerer and Terminator armor for like a deep strike point click, put another plus one AP on something, which can stack that AP real high for this army. Um, this was Purge the Fold, which is typically a pretty rough mission for Gene Star Cults, just in general... We're not amazing, like we bleed units pretty fast. Uh, and as you can see in here, like he has very clearly got a kill more on turn three. Um, but I was going second, which meant that I was in a pretty good situation to just kind of sit there and get my points. Uh, I have this prediction down as a four. I feel like, again, generally, this army specifically doesn't have a ton of melee, which means it's really hard for him to dig me out of transport or dig me out of my transport port or dig me out of ruins. Um, the obliterators only have so much range and they're not that good again. This is in Veterans of the Long War. They're not full rerolling. There's no Abaddon. They're probably not just like one-shotting units behind walls. Even Acolyte squads are like not entirely likely to die to them. Um, and I have good ways to card transports, right? You can do some really cool shenanigans, and we'll touch on one of them this game with the pilot with the six-inch pilot and consolidation stratagem to try to crack transports open. Um, and the board is pretty we played on a neutral board. I think this was just like one of the last boards available. Um, so nothing too crazy. You might recognize it. It's the same board I played against Pascal on, uh, just in a different um different deployment. This was Crucible of Battle rather than Zerg and Destroy. Um, so I kind of this is the deployment picture. I take up very defensive positions. The truck is in a nice safe space. The uh, aberrants and the gene stealers go infiltrating onto that right hand side where they can threaten that objective and then the other gene stealers just stand at the stand at the back left they are six and a bit inches away from the other side of that wall so that if he charges me with his dread reaver character um they can't go back behind the wall and they would have to sit in front of my ridge runners and then my ridge runners just played on a super safe angle um this is one of those games where the ridge runners don't do a ton renegade readers are fast enough to get to them most places that you put them so they just kind of sat there and threatened and stopped him coming out and then picked they like went in one turn picked up a rhino and then like made his vindicator come like really close to my aberrants so my aberrants could go in charge of the vindicator that was kind of the play i went for here um so he kind of staged up into the middle started doing some secondaries pushed his vehicles up a little bit more um and then i just kind of took staging positions you know we kind of look at the secondaries here he does his containment and then he starts uh and then he starts to sabotage. I do my cleanse, I discard sabotage because he has a warp talons and you know I'm just not not dealing with that. Uh, I don't want to get advanced and charge that by warp talons and lose my squishy unit for him to then have to hold the card. Uh he then kind of draws sabotage and area denial and he doesn't do anything crazy for it. He just like pokes uh I think he pokes like cipher onto the middle. So I've alone up, it's very hard for me to drive with cipher. He has the shoot back when you shoot him, so like my acolyte squads are not very good at doing it. Um just like a little bit messy. Um, and then he kind of puts this truck on this rune here, the one on the right-hand side of the middle objective. Uh, he puts his truck there, and I ingress my metamorphs. And I go for the, I go for the. all right, your transport's got uppity, and it's near two of my units play, which is if you walk a unit up to the truck and charge it and wrap it in such a way that he still has a space to disembark within three, and then charge it with another unit, leaving that space available. Um, if you kill the truck or the transport with the first unit's activation, so say the aberrants, then the unit will spill out in that space, which is very close to your other unit, and you can slam the six inch consolidation pile in a consolidation stratagem on it and activate it six inches across the gap of where the transport was into that unit and pick it up. Uh, now, unfortunately, so I had my metamorph squad around one side of the objective, my average squad around, or one side of the truck, my average squad around one the other, and I activated at it and I left it on one. Uh, it he double five, he armor contempted the past double fives against the uh, the two wounds I handed him for the abominant uh, with the plus one to wound stratagem, lived on one, uh, and then the metamorphs obviously just annihilated it. But instead of killing the legionnaire squad and the, um, I think that I still had a rubric squad inside, instead of just killing them, we ended up getting into this really, really grindy situation on that, that top objective um, where like his obliterators came out and started choosing stuff and his. Um, Legionnaires obviously charged in and like they picked up an aberrant squad. The bomb didn't stand back up. Um, just kind of very messy. But then the um the gene stealers came out of the transport, cleaned up all of that, sat in front of him, took a turn to deal with. Uh, and then I kind of I had pushed the left hand objective within a bot with an aberrant bomb squad at this point. Um, the one that deployed at the top left had like gone and dealt with the chosen squad uh, and then killed it. You know, the red runners had driven up top left, shot a rhino to death, the aberrant charged the contents, precision at the character, got stuck in for a combat there, then walked towards the rubric squad, charged it. The other one ingress, charged the vindicator that came forward to kill the kill the Ridge runners, and then kind of like I blocked down that top left objective to the degree that I was holding it consistently. He couldn't really take me off the bottom right objective anymore. I had like uh, the gene stealers, uh, I had like replaced the gene stealer squad and the average squad that were there with an acolyte squad, and the truck was just sat there and like just kind of held both the objectives, started threatening hold more. And as you can see on my score here, I go like, uh, I think I go kill more because I had perfect information 
or hold more. I think it was probably kill more into hold one into hold one hold more or hold one hold and then kill more kill kill more hold more kill more hold more for the back two turns to max out on primary and then yeah 33 on secondaries just the list doesn't score like perfect on secondaries you don't have three inch deep strike you're not accessing your backfield there's not up and downy outside of the average roll so you're just kind of 30 ish is probably your average secondary score uh but he yeah just kind of ran out of steam you know he had some pretty good cards the last turn overall my force for prisoners uh, and obviously his score is pretty decent just because it's purge the foe it's hard to 20 on anybody in purge the foe but he was just kind of in a very very difficult position very early. Uh, part of that was going second. Part of that was um, just like him having a real difficulty dealing with units inside transports uh, or behind walls. Just not a lot of not a lot of interaction points with that. Uh, and he put the obliterators on the board. Like the advanced shoot on Renegade Raiders to give them a lot of speed. But it obviously also meant that I could kind of ignore them. I could just measure, you know, like okay, they if they roll anything short of a five, they're not shooting at all. Uh, and if they roll, if they want to run out and try that, then they're going to be in the open, and I'll get to charge them with something or shoot them with something. Right, and they're not. They're not just going to lift an aberrant squad behind a wall, hitting on fours, winning on fours. Like this is just not going to happen, uh, which does make it quite difficult for him to use them. Right. Uh, so closing thoughts for the list. Um, I think Biosentic is fantastic. The army felt really good. I was really impressed with how often it felt like every unit was in combat. Just straight away um the unit that infiltrates was just in combat because it would just go towards my opponents like most pressing the thing that the place my, i knew my opponent had to go right if they have to go towards their expansion objective and my, my that's what is there it walks out six it charges four or five inches makes it in almost always i don't think i ever had it fail its charge definitely could happen sucks to suck um the squad that's deployed on the board just ran to my expansion objective and just was like i am here anything that wants to brawl with me i have it and it either held it or my opponent or, or it went past it when my opponent didn't pressure me and then it was in combat on turn two or turn three almost every game and then the last squad rapid ingress outside nine uh moves forward six and then with plus one to charge you cannot fail that rapid ingress charge so even on a double one you still make your three inch charge in that situation which meant that it was very consistently just everything was in combat and then the pure strains have an average range of 24 out of the truck um you could also put like aberrant squads inside the truck if you're playing a matchup where you're worried about them like dying to um exorcist for example um then like at least give them a little bit of protection against that right there's lots of things you could do um and then like having you know i had five acolyte squads it really really did feel like i just had all the flexibility in the world for uh keeping my units alive and as you can see on the scores like the game two and game three were the games that i went first in uh, and those were obviously 13 sevens much closer games just you know prior nexus benefits the player going second quite a lot and the games i went second in were games one four and five where i had you know of a 19 a 15 and a 14 just very consistent wins that really felt very controlled the entire time the game against vanguard definitely like could have gotten messy if those gene stars are just like really you know if they'd all rolled six inch advances into like 12 inch charges i would have probably lost a decent amount more but i still felt pretty good about the position i was in that game because of the board we were playing on and the position i put myself in um but yeah the list has had a ton of resiliency the fact that you can get units back but you don't need to like you definitely introduce uh the memes that you might have saw on the first page i'm going to go back to it because it makes me laugh um you definitely introduce a lot more variance to the army um normally in something like islander call you have the four up uh bring units back and then the five brings you back when an abominant dies you get to roll a four up five on death a two up to do to do two to three more wounds a two up to stand back up and you can like i have definitely failed all three of those before and just been like well i guess my abominant just doesn't do anything today uh, and that is really frustrating. Um, and it definitely, there was a lot of variance. Once you put, introduce rolling charges to an army, like Jeans are called as well, like with Outlander Claw, you throw a lot of charges. You throw a lot of nines because you just, you might as well. But with this army, it's like, if you don't hit charges, you will not do damage. You will not take objectives. And, you know, aberrants are pretty low OC. So if you don't kill an average amount of stuff, you might not flip the objective, right? It introduces a lot of variance, which can be a little frustrating, but it did feel like it was capable of pushing some pretty big wins, which, as you can see, it definitely did. Uh, it is great fun to play. The damage up is very real. Um, some of the issues that it definitely has, uh, no pullback and charge is a really big one. If you can tag its units with, like, something that doesn't die, like, the genes, they're just stuck there. Like, they're not getting out. Ridge Runners are blast weapons with the mining lasers, which means they can't even, like, shoot out a vehicle. So, you know, if there's, like, an aberrant squad and you can charge it with, you know, like, 10 grots at the front and tag, like, five of them, and then you charge in your truck at the end and go, okay, one aberrant can fight the truck. It can only do eight damage. This truck is going to be there. Your aberrant squad is in this combat next turn. Um, you cannot get out. Right? You are just stuck there. Uh, so there's a lot of, like, there's a decent amount of, like, manipulation there where if you are canny with managing its units you can definitely solve it and if you can stop them getting back precisioning at characters is quite annoying for the army like yes they stand back up but like it's not amazing like if you use the brood lord like that genius squad loses almost all of its output uh patriarch apologies like it really does need its um devastating wounds to like be a consistent damage source and there's not a lot of shooting if you can kill the ridge runners if your opponent gives you them or you make it, they make a mistake or you just prioritize getting to them um be like the thing 
one thing people do a lot against Ridge Runners, um, if you separate your units, right, your vehicles, you know, and you have them all spread out, it's very easy for the Ridge Runners to pick up an angle against one of them and shoot it, and then the Biosantic Army will go, okay, I'm going to move block you from getting onto that angle so that nothing can shoot them back, right? And it happens in most of my games. That one's not a shooting matchup, but, like, this game here, right? Like, the Tyrant effects, is, like, all the monsters are very spread out, so I was able to just pick one, pick an angle, and then move block that angle so I couldn't get shot back or tag the unit that would be able to get to it uh, and just restrict my ones out. But if there was just, like, a line of two Tyrant effects here, like, covering this one, and a Tyrant effects and an X-Queen on the same line here, right? Like, if I expose to shoot one of them, the other one gets to shoot me back. There's nothing I can do about it besides killing both of them, and that's just not realistic. It is possible, but it's not likely. Um, so if you're playing this, like, single-source damage output, like Red Runners, um, Stack your stack your transport stack your damage output together because it's not like you know if there's two lancers, two lancers is pretty likely to kill one tank. You know they might kill, but what you don't want to do in that situation is stack both of them together because if you put two tanks next to each other and the first lancer high rolls, well the second one has a target. But I needed to put both lancers there to make sure I killed the first one. But if I happen to get the second one, great, right? So don't put them together in that situation. Put it where it can move to cover it because right? iron sword is not going to move block you. But against the single source damage output, like. I'm not going to split fire the Ridge Runners, right? I'm not psychotic. So you're, there's no downside to just having them next to each other, having them covering each other. Like, you need to cover them without moving, right? That's the thing you need to be looking for. The Ridge Runners one doesn't fire and fade. It's just trying to play angles. It's just trying to use move blocks. So get yourself in a position where, you know, like, you are sat on the angle to shoot it back, right? And that was what happened with Day, right? He sat, his first Ridge Runner squad pushed it here, and then his second squad was behind it where it could move to that position and where it couldn't get moved up because it was covered by heroic intervention. So I came out, I shot them, and then he shot me back. And, you know, I killed one Ranger journey, he killed one Ranger But I finished off the other returners and come out and tied the last one. So we kind of got ahead on that trade. It was just, he was just, you know, it's a genes I got melee matchup where I was able to get to his returners. The, you know, the Patriarch squad advanced and charged from here and got to him, right? Shocking, I know. Um, but yeah, like, keep your like pay attention to whether you're putting your tanks isolated or together right because it matters if you are playing against single sources of damage and you know you need to shoot them back and you know they can move block you keep them together if you're playing against stratified damage don't stack your vehicles because if they high roll they get to, they get an additional target right if your opponent's got two lancers or two vindicators and those two vindicators are together like two vindicators it probably you probably need two vindicators to kill a malaceptor um, but if you put a mouse scepter and an X-Queen next to each other and the first one happens to do 24 damage, well, then I get to shoot an X-Queen as well. Um, whereas if they're if they're separate, I probably still need to put two of them there, which means that when you walk out next turn with your Tran effects, you can expose, right? But you don't lose the X-Queen as well when the high roll happens, right? So you need to decide if you're playing around the high roll, the average case, or you know what the in-betweens look like. Um, as far as list changes, I think uh, we had one day to change them stuff. Uh, I think my list would cut one one sort of acolytes with hand flamers, um, which is uh, like having four, having five spells is great. I could definitely go down to four. I found a lot of the games I was dropping one of them onto my home objective anyway because my ridge runners wanted to move about or like screen my backfield a little more uh, or like get in line of sight for their stubbers so they could like hit on threes or just contribute to like clearing up like a rubric squad or nurglings or whatever right um just little things um so i would replace i'm probably so i for battle of britain this weekend which i will not be doing an episode on i've replaced them with acolytes with all pistols so just give me the cp regeneration on a four plus on my home objective uh, i did find myself a little cp star the army wants to rapid ingress it wants a six inch finally consolidate it wants to grenade it wants to overwatch right like you have all, all these demands on your cp and obviously yeah you're re -roll, you're rolling charges so cp rolling charges is a very very important thing to have access to um so yeah, I would like I would have liked a little bit of extra CP in my game, so I've gone with that. And because I was dropping one of my home objectives anyway, it feels like it shouldn't change a ton. Um, you could definitely do a clam of us or ten neophytes or a second truck. Uh, the list does have an enhancement that it could cut pretty freely uh, in the version I'm running, which is mutagenic deviation. I have the the heal enhancement um, because I had ten points, but that could very easily be a Goliath truck as well, which would give you some more flexibility with things like metamorphs because they are quite squishy. Uh, there are some versions of the build that like don't play the melee, don't play the laser red runners. You could put in like a bio fake as an additional uh, metamorph squad, all that kind of thing. I broadly quite like the archetype. I like having the amount of units I had, uh, and I like having one red runner squad because it stops people just completely disrespecting your deployment. If my if I don't have any guns, my opponent can just deploy on the line and just be like, well, what are you going to do about it? And the answer is nothing. So having one red runner squad with scout threatening that twenty one inch move on turn one really does make your opponent just go, okay. I need to like deploy safely. I need to deploy back, and that gives me so much more space to work with my infiltrates, my scouts, and my advancing charges. Right, and that's a very, very important thing to have access to. Um, so yeah, if you're playing an army like that, definitely consider. If your opponent is just playing all all guns, no fun, uh, or all fun, no guns, um, you can deploy a lot more, a lot more disrespectfully. Um, yeah. Set up for heroics, keep yourself in a good position. Like Biosantic is not unbeatable. Uh, I literally beat it, right? That's that's what that means. Uh, but it's very good right now. If you are looking for advice on how to beat it, 
uh, or you're looking to get some more advice on playing it, or you just liked what you heard and you want to hear more from me, you can check out stat-check.com slash coaching or drop me a line uh, at Innis Wilson, uh, Innis hashtag 0472 or Innis Wilson on Discord or leave drop us an email at coaching at stat-check.com. I'd love to help you out if you're looking for any advice on anything 4K related. Uh, it is my full-time job. It is how I get to keep doing things like these and going to tournaments and telling you guys all about it. I hope everybody has enjoyed the episode. If you did, please leave it live, comment, like, comment, subscription, check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash stat check or the YouTube membership, both available in the description. You can ask their Discord. You can give me feedback on this. If you have any name suggestions for the show, I'm still willing to hear them. Uh, and obviously, I deeply, deeply thrive on positive feedback. It is the only reason I do things. Um, I'm fully, fully willing to admit that to YouTube. Um, so yeah, positive feedback really, really does make make the world go around. It makes me keeps my motivation high to do these. These are a ton of work, uh, which is why they have been slowing slowed down. Uh, they happen as and when I can make them happen. Uh, they are not recurring content in the same sense that we do them every week. But the more people are enjoying them and the more people they tell me that they're enjoying them, the more I will be able to find the time to keep doing them. Uh, the last one, unfortunately, didn't do as well as I would have hoped. Uh, but I think that is partly, it was another um, Outlander video. We'd already done one. So, you know, such is life. Uh, I make them because the people who want to watch them watch them, not because everybody watches them. Um, and if they, if this has benefited you at all, I am deeply, deeply, deeply glad. Um, that will be the end of me being sappy because I have to bounce. Thank you so much, everybody, and I will catch you next time. As I missed that.